To hear this and many more audiobooks in full in a podcast feed, please visit the first link in the description below. Thank you for your support. Syndicalism by William Z. Foster and Earl C. Ford A reprint of the original 1912 edition with a new introduction by James R. Barrett Introduction to the 1990 edition In your hands you hold a little piece of dynamite, an explosive political pamphlet, with a good deal of significance for the history of labor and radicalism in the United States. Syndicalism, first published in 1912, offers probably the most developed theory of pure syndicalism produced in the United States. The pamphlet is important for a number of reasons. It shows us a self-educated worker trying to come to terms with the system he faces every day of his life. In this way, the pamphlet brings theory down out of the clouds and suggests its relationship to the experience of workers under capitalism. Syndicalism also provides an unusually clear picture of the ideas and the mentality associated with the movement that took its name. In the United States, the pamphlet represented the theoretical position of the Syndicalist League of North America, a small but important organization that pioneered methods and trained a cadre of organizers that shaped the 20th century radical labor movement. To understand this pamphlet in a broader context, we need to look at William Z. Foster, its primary author, the period in which the pamphlet was created, the Syndicalist League of North America, and finally at the legacy of the man, the organization, and the ideas. Syndicalism was shaped in part by Foster's own experiences. Born in 1881 into an immigrant family of 23, he was reared in the slums of Philadelphia. His father, an amateur athlete, street brawler, and carriage washer, was also an ardent Irish Republican who passed his politics on to his son. Foster's mother was a devout Catholic and hoped that William, the brightest of her brood, would enter the priesthood. Instead, the family's poverty forced Foster to abandon school after the third grade. He left home as a teenager and wandered around the country and around the world, working at a wide range of jobs from deep water sailor and metal miner to locomotive fireman. His family's poverty and the misery he saw around him in his youth inspired in Foster a deep but inchoate resentment and frustration. Capitalism was a system he hated deeply without really understanding it. Foster encountered socialism on a Philadelphia street corner and later joined the Socialist Party in 1904, soon after its foundation. In 1909, he became a member of the Industrial Workers of the World, IWW, a revolutionary labor union advocating industrial unionism and organization of the unorganized. His intellectual development throughout the early 20th century was shaped by a series of dangerous and unhealthy jobs and by a frustration with the bourgeois character of the Socialist Party and its reform program. He rejected electoral politics as a dead end and inclined more and more toward an exclusively industrial strategy. Foster taught himself to read French and German, devoured the classic works of Marxism, and, in 1910 to 1911, traveled around Europe in order to study the ideas and strategies of workers' movements there. The frequent allusions in the pamphlet to labor organizations and particular strikes in France, Italy, England, Germany, and elsewhere reflect the enduring influence of his European experiences. He was most impressed with the French syndicalists, and this influence can be seen throughout syndicalism. Above all, he became convinced that the strategy of dual unionism, the notion that radicals must establish separate revolutionary unions to compete with those of the American Federation of Labor, was a disaster. Instead, he embraced 
the French notion of a militant minority of syndicalists boring from within the mainstream labor unions in order to win them over to a revolutionary program. This dedication to boring from within caused Foster to break with the IWW with its structure of separate revolutionary industrial unions and to formulate his own theory of syndicalism, a far more direct reflection of the international movement than the IWW. Given this international influence and the blistering rhetoric of syndicalism, the pamphlet was written in a most unlikely setting, the prairies and farm communities of central Illinois and Indiana. Working as a canvasman for a traveling theatrical show during the summer of 1912, Foster erected and stowed the group's tents, but in the mornings and afternoons he was free to do his writing in an empty tent or out in the fields. Working with Earl C. Ford, an old friend from the IWW, Foster hammered out what became the theoretical statement for a new syndicalist organization. Ford's role in producing the pamphlet seems to have involved providing the funds and discussing the ideas with Foster, who was the main author. To some degree, Syndicalism is simply part of a very old and rich tradition of working-class social theory, an example of the kind of thinking generated by self-educated workers throughout the history of capitalism and workers' resistance to that system. It begins with the basics. What is the nature of labor's problem under capitalism and how can it be solved? Something is radically wrong, Foster writes, in a society that produces such extremes of poverty and wealth and toil and idleness. Next, Foster considers some fake causes and quack remedies, rejecting very popular bourgeois arguments like social Darwinism that explained the worker's status as a product of immutable social and biological laws or of his or her own depravity. Foster locates the source of the problem in the wage system, quote, the most brazen and gigantic robbery ever perpetrated since the world began. The wages system, end quote, he concludes, quote, must be abolished, end quote. To this point, Foster is in good company. Both his questions and his answers lay at the very heart of the 19th century labor reform impulse. His analysis is simple, straightforward, but also compelling even today. The system has changed enormously since 1912, but the system of wage labor continues to produce both enormous wealth and widespread poverty and suffering. It is Foster's solutions to the problem of wage labor that distinguish syndicalism from earlier theories and make it a prime example of early 20th century labor radicalism. His emphasis on the primacy of industrial over political organization and action, his faith in the militancy of industrial workers, his forthright advocacy of restriction of output, machine breaking, and other forms of sabotage, his cataclysmic description of the general strike, and his anti-statist vision of the future syndicalist society are all characteristic of a distinctive brand of labor radicalism. Workers created the syndicalist movement in the face of a new sort of political economy which wedded monopoly capitalism to the centralized bureaucratic and servile state. During the first two decades of the 20th century, large syndicalist movements emerged in France, Spain, Italy, and elsewhere. And even in England and the United States, where the movements were much smaller, syndicalist ideas and strategies were pervasive. The ideas in syndicalism are important. They represent one worker's efforts to understand the capitalist system and devise a means of destroying it. But they also represent the theory behind a social movement which swept the world in the era of early monopoly capitalism. Foster's strong faith 
that science, technology, and a systematic organization of industry and society could solve the problems of the world was characteristic not only of syndicalists, but also of many of the era's intellectuals and reformers. The anarchist influence is also unmistakable. Indeed, Foster's vision of a new society owes a great deal more to anarchism then to Marxian socialism. The sections on syndicalism and political action capture the syndicalists' strong antipathy for the Socialist Party, its reliance on the state, and its reformism. Yet, in other respects, Foster's syndicalism seems to foreshadow ideas and strategies that were later embodied in the early Communist Party. Both the concept of a militant minority of activists who will lead the movement to victory and the profound distaste for bourgeois notions of democracy probably made it easier for many syndicalists to embrace Leninism during the revolutionary period at the end of the First World War. But... To understand the appeal of syndicalism, the experience and the flavor of the movement, as well as its theory, we also need to look closely at the pamphlet's language and tone. A bitter edge here suggests the mentality of some of the most advanced elements in the working class movement, those whom the syndicalists called the militant minority. Foster himself was repulsed by the capitalist system quite early, and the bitter quality of his rhetoric and ideas stayed with him throughout his life. The scab is, quote, so much vermin to be ruthlessly exterminated, end quote. Natural rights do not exist. Rights go to those with power, and the central task is to develop and direct working class power against the parasites who now control the system. Laws, morals, and ethics do not concern him when he turns to the problem of strategy, only the efficacy of the measures adopted. If Foster's projections about a revolutionary movement based on the labor unions seems overly optimistic, this owes something to the context in which they were shaped. Between 1909 and 1922, the United States experienced a gigantic strike wave with more than a million workers striking in every year between 1916 and 1922. It was not simply the size of the movement, however, that caught the imagination of labor activists, but also its industrial and social breadth. Many of these were mass strikes organized and carried out by unskilled immigrants, including young women, people whom labor leaders had considered unorganizable. Far from resisting organization, the immigrant laborers and factory operatives responded with a remarkable enthusiasm and fought their strikes with a spirit of ingenuity, often missing in those of the skilled and native-born. The Lawrence strike to which Foster alludes was one of these mass strikes. In the spring of 1912, a small group of Polish women spontaneously walked out of their textile mill over a wage dispute and sparked a strike of more than 20,000 workers drawn from a score of ethnic communities. Here and in many other such strikes, radical minorities, in this case the IWW, played an important role. At Lawrence, the immigrant workers scored a smashing success, which fueled and provided an example for struggles in many other industries. In the decade between 1909 and 1919, similar strikes racked the auto, steel, meatpacking, garment, petrochemical, mining, rubber, and other industries as immigrant workers fashioned new forms of labor organization and strike strategy. Although many of these movements were eventually destroyed during the political reaction and employers offensive in the 1919-1922 period, Foster wrote syndicalism just as this strike wave was beginning to rise. If he thought he saw the roots for a new, more militant labor movement being sown in the years before World War I, he was not wrong. 
the Syndicalist League of North America, SLNA, which Foster organized with a number of other former Wobblies and working-class anarchists early in 1912, was a small but significant part of this movement, and Foster himself was very much at its center. He published Syndicalism privately when he returned to his home base of Chicago in September 1912. The League remained a very loose, decentralized organization, never maintaining more than a dozen branches with a total membership of perhaps 2,000, most of these workers in western and midwestern cities. While espousing the radical theory outlined in syndicalism, League activists concentrated their daily agitation on bread and butter issues and played an important role in union organizing and strike action in Kansas City, St. Louis, and Chicago. By boring from within, the League's militant minority sank deep roots in these local labor movements and created alliances with progressive trade unionists that the IWW never achieved because of its adherence to the strategy of dual unionism. Long after the decline of the SLNA in 1914, its former activists played important roles in several local labor movements. They provided leadership during the massive organizing drives of the World War I years, and many of them eventually abandoned syndicalism and helped to build the Communist Party in the decade following the war. During the conservative 1920s, former syndicalists provided the party with much of its industrial base through the organization of the Trade Union Educational League, TUEL, an important radical opposition group within the American Federation of Labor, AFL. Foster won a national reputation directing successful organizing drives in the meatpacking and steel industries during the war and leading the great 1919 steel strike. Each of these experiences confirmed his faith in the tactic of boring from within. His greatest successes came when he muted his syndicalist rhetoric and entered the AFL as a paid organizer. In this capacity, he showed a real brilliance in organizing and strike strategy, but his syndicalist past often returned to haunt him. During the steel strike, the companies reprinted thousands of copies of syndicalism and distributed them throughout the steel mill towns in order to discredit him in the eyes of the conservative AFL leadership and his own rank and file. Subpoenaed to appear before a special Senate committee investigating the strike, he was grilled at great length regarding his views and confronted with some of the most extreme language and ideas in the pamphlet. While Foster weathered the storm and actually received public endorsements from conservative AFL leaders, the situation underscores the dilemma faced by syndicalists who held to a revolutionary program while working in mainstream unions. Foster repudiated his syndicalism in testimony before the Senate committee, but there is little doubt that he remained a revolutionary throughout his time with the AFL. He was won over to communism on a visit to Soviet Russia in 1921 and joined the Communist Party later that year. During the early 20s, he built and led the TUEL and retained many of his contacts in the mainstream labor movement, especially in Chicago. In the course of the 20s, however, Foster became increasingly involved in party factional conflicts and more and more isolated from non-communist activists. His reluctant support in late 1928 for the Trade Union Unity League, a dual labor federation of revolutionary unions, represented a decisive break with his earlier theories and career and increased this isolation. A severe heart attack and breakdown in late 1932 slowed Foster considerably, though he remained active in the leadership of the party, serving as its national chairman between 1932 and 1957 and representing an increasingly sectarian position even in the era of the Popular Front. He organized the expulsion of Earl Browder, 
the architect of the party's Popular Front policies and Foster's comrade in the SLNA days. Foster also led the party's reversion to a more orthodox, Stalinist position and fought all efforts to reform and democratize the organization following its decline during the McCarthy era. He died in Moscow in 1961 after a long illness and was buried in Waldheim Cemetery in Chicago. If we only look at individual biography and organizational history, it might be easy to conclude that the point of view represented in syndicalism passed from the scene rather quickly and that it has little relevance for the situation of workers today. And indeed, Foster's detailed blueprint for a decentralized syndicalist society may sound strange in an era when the state plays such an important role in labor relations and in the lives of workers more generally. No major labor organization in the U.S. today adheres explicitly to a syndicalist program. But this would be a simplistic notion of where workers' ideas come from, why some decline and others become more popular. As a pervasive, if diffuse, influence, syndicalist sentiments and strategies persist in labor movements around the world. Even in the United States, we find such tendencies. Restrictions of output and various forms of sabotage are not unusual in American factories. Workers, along with many other Americans, harbor deep suspicions about the motives and abilities of government officials and the role of government in their lives. Abstention from voting, which is generally high in the United States, is particularly high among poor and working class people who have generally shown more inclination toward what Foster termed direct action in the workplace and the streets than toward political militancy. If we define syndicalism as the official theory of a particular organization, a formal body of thought, then indeed it would be difficult to find its influence among workers today. However, if we see syndicalism as a tendency arising naturally from one's experiences at work, a set of strategies developed by workers themselves to deal with their problems in large-scale bureaucratic mass production industry, an inclination to rely on industrial rather than political organization and struggle, if this is how we understand the term, then syndicalism continues to be an influence. James R. Barrett, Chicago, May 1990.